reading this week is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentary on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This week's reading is The Secret of Right Action. <clears throat> Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. One of the most famous stories in the Gospels is that of Martha and Mary. Jesus, visiting the home of Martha, was teaching while her sister Mary sat at his feet, absorbing his divine love and wisdom. Martha, meanwhile, busied herself with serving her guests and was upset with Mary for not helping her. Lord, she cried, doesn't it matter to you that my sister has left me to do all this serving alone? Please ask her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. This story is classic, for Martha's complaint is very understandable, and not, on the surface of it, spiritually wrong. Jesus may well have told Mary to get up and help her. We don't really know that he didn't consider it as, as he always was of others' needs. But the teaching here doesn't concern the obvious dilemma of devotees, to work for God or to spend all one's time in prayer. It concerns, rather, the attitude of the mind. Jesus didn't tell Martha, Martha, you are working too much. He told her, rather, you are letting your work affect your inner peace. That was the contrast, not work versus contemplation, but restless preoccupation versus peaceful absorption under all circumstances. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, actions performed under the influence of desire are greatly inferior to those which are guided by wisdom. Happiness eludes people when they act from self-interest. Seek shelter, therefore, in the equanimity of wisdom. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Oh, good morning. Starting to have some spring mornings. Spring days now, finally. So hopefully we'll continue with that. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to say thank you for David Eby. He's our choir director this morning, and uh, some of you are familiar with who he is. But he came up from from Portland. He used to uh, be our the choir director for Ananda Village for many years, and then he came up to Portland. He's playing, doing music there, and so we luckily he's close enough to us so he can come up and do music with us now and then. And, it's just most fun to, uh, and it's very um, learning. You know, we learn a lot when he, he conducts, so it it's, was very special for us too. And those of you who were here for that opening song, um, I don't know if you felt it, but I think most of us felt it. You know, if we felt a, like a quietness afterwards, you know, a stillness, I guess is a better word. There was an attunement there that we all, the choir, managed to achieve, and, and it permeated everybody. I'm, you know, it was it was wonderful. So we got another song coming up for uh, the offertory. So I wanted to start with this, um, share a story with you, and it doesn't exactly fit the topic, but it's it's kind of fun. And it, it came as a, as an email, <laughs> and I, this is this was a story that was sent to me by the senior class president of Laconia High School, which is where I graduated. And he, anyway, he's still living there in the little town of Laconia and uh, with a bunch of other classmates who names I recognize, some of them and most of them I don't. I've never been back for a class reunion, so I don't know how he got my email, but he did, probably through Facebook or something. But anyway, this was really cute, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to start with a story like this. Um, this is called the centipede. Now you know a centipede is like a caterpillar, but it has a hundred legs. It's kind of like a flattened caterpillar with a hundred legs. So anyway, it's a story about a centipede. It says, I'm going to read it because it's a nice flow to the way it was uh, written. 
a single guy decided life would be more fun if he had a pet. So he went to the pet store and told the owner that he wanted to buy an unusual pet. After some discussion, he finally bought a talking millipede, a centipede, a talking centipede, which came in a little white box, which was to be his house. He took the box back home, found a good spot for the box, and decided he would start off by taking his new pet to church with him. But that was why I thought this would be appropriate for, for hair. <laughs> so he asked the centipede in the box, would you like to go to church with me today? We will have a very good time. But there was no answer from his new pet. This bothered him a bit, but he waited a few minutes and then he asked again, how about going to church with me and receive blessings? But again, there was no answer from his new friend and pet. So we waited a few more minutes thinking about this situation. Well, the guy finally decided to invite the centipede one last time. This time he put his face up against the centipede's house and shouted, Hey in there, would you like to go to church with me and learn about God? This time a little voice came out of the box. I heard you the first time. I'm putting on my shoes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know how to relate it, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> so, Wanting to get to talk about Martha and Mary, I think for most of us it's a familiar Bible passage that, you know, if nothing else, we've heard about it over the years. And it's actually something that Christian churches talk about too, the Marthas and, Mar Marthas and the Marys of the world, the Marthas who serve, you know, so dedicatively and, you know, get everything done. And then the Marys who are a little more laid back and you know, they are a little easygoing and, you know, perhaps pray a little bit more and um, more inward. And so, you know, we can see how we fit in that area. And we're not saying one is better than the other. And, and Jesus, though, pointed out something very important in this story that kind of gets lost when people talk about this. He was not really scolding Mary, um, scolding Martha for her service at this particular um, event that she was serving in, but he was really telling her that you know she missed the point. She missed the point of her service. And that was what he was trying to point out to Martha, that you know she was she was getting anxious and restless and and upset and you know and rightly so to some extent we can look at it, most of us who are the Marthas, we can look at it and say, you know, it would, be, it would have been nice for her sister to have helped her, you know, her sister was just sitting there. Um, listening to what Jesus was saying, but Jesus wasn't supporting that in in this particular passage. He was he was telling you that you know she she didn't get it. Service is not something that you just do. It's not just something that you do. It's more than that. And you know, just for a minute, we can I think just think relate to that, can't we? Here at Ananda, we have so many ways to serve. And I think, you know, everyone here at some point has, has done some service. And, um, you know, everything from the setup of the chairs, you know, the sound systems, the music, the ushers, the greeters, the uh, people that clean up afterwards, the refreshments that we're going to have. It goes on and on. A myriad of people serve. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful way to participate and, and also feel more part of what's going on. Um, and there's also service that we do, you know, for our events and our classes and everything. Everything from preparing food to serving food to cleaning up and cleaning up and cleaning up and cleaning up. <laughs> Seems to be one of the biggies that we do. So anyway, um, so what is that, why is it that serving, you know, he, why was he scolding her, not for the service, but for he was scolding because of the attitude of her mind, that she really was serving in 
a very ego, ego, ego state. She was still thinking she was doing it. You know, she was having to do all this work, and you know, it was work, and you know, it was up to her. So she had that that edge, you know, which we get when you think of the service. I named a bunch of it here, but whatever it is, you know, don't we sometimes get upset about it? You know, it doesn't going the way we want. We don't have enough time. You know, all those things that can make us like the way Martha was in the situation. And yet, Jesus actually told her what she needed to do. And she said that one thing is need, is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. And so what it was, what was that good part? Just sitting there? Yeah, that sounds good, but you have to do all the stuff. You know, someone has to do it, right? Well, yes, and you can do it both. In other words, it's not either or, it's both and. And so um, what Jesus was saying was that this good part is, is what we need to do when we're serving. Mary was absorbing Jesus' vibrations, absorbing Jesus' words, and that was the good part. And so for us too, as we're serving, we need to bring that awareness of God's presence into what it is that we're doing. And this is not easy. I know we've talked about this before. We're not saying this is easy to do. But we need to continue to practice what it is that we're talking about here. And Jesus actually offered three teachings in one for this one particular thing. He said, first, you have to be non-attached, keep focused on God, and practice inner communion. So if while you're serving, you can do all those things, then Jesus wouldn't scold you (laughs) because you wouldn't be coming from your own eager-centeredness. You'd be coming more from a God-centeredness. And from that center of God-centeredness, you'd realize that, you know, even though you're, you're functioning or you think you're functioning your body, really, you know, we're just instruments of the divine. You know, he's made these bodies. I mean, he created this. And so why can't he also function through this if we let him. And what we have to do is let him. We have to invite him or her, Divine Mother, to just take over and be what it is that we can be a Mary and a Martha both at the same time. So that was one of the important lessons uh, in this, the new path, which is the, the uh, book uh, autobiography by Swami Kriyananda, who is our, our founder, a lot of wonderful stories that relate to this. And Swami Kriyananda um, did live with Master for three and a half years, for, with Yogananda for three and a half years. And in those years, he, of course, learned a lot. And he tells many stories. And the one I want to relate is the one when he was a young monk. He was in, like 22 years old. And he was living at Mount Washington, which is where the, the, uh, the center that Yogananda founded. And, um, but they, they used to go to this place called 29 Palms, which is a desert retreat center that Yogananda would go to to kind of retreat away from all the busy life that he had there and do a lot of writing. And so some of the monks would come with him. And during that time, they decided to build a swimming pool. And I was told later that they never, ever used it. It was never even ever filled with water. So <clears throat> obviously there was something else going on. But uh, Yogananda asked him to build a swimming pool. And one of the many things they had to do, the digging the hole, of course, but then they had to put down the cement, you know, line it with the cement to keep the water in. And what, what they learned was that you, you couldn't just pour the cement and then rest, and you know, the next day you pour some more, and the next day you pour some more. The cement had to be poured, they call it, in one pour. Everything all at once, otherwise it wouldn't be leak-proof. So there was a number of monks besides Swami Kriyananda that was working on this project, and so they started pouring the cement and mixing the cement. I mean, this wasn't when they had those, the trucks, you know, that were the big turnarounds that, that, you know, they pour it in. No, this was all done by hand. So they had to mix the cement with the water, and then they had to shovel it into the uh, wheelbarrow, and then they shovel it into the, the pool, and then they had to smooth it out. So anyway, this went on hour after hour after hour. And if you can imagine, in the hot desert sun, there was some challenging 
attitudes going on here. And eventually, one of the, the monks just couldn't take it. He said, okay, he said, I didn't come here to pour cement, dig ditches. He said, I came here to find God. And he said, I'm done. And so he went over and he sat down. And there he sat. And meanwhile, the other monks um, decided that they would start doing something to help themselves a little bit. So they decided to, to chant. And so they started to sing to God um, the many, many chants that Yogananda had taught them. And they were singing away as they were doing the cement. And the hours kept going by all night long. All night long they poured cement. And they kept singing and chanting. And the other guy kept sit, sitting there on the bank watching them grumbling away and grumbling, grumbling. Finally, sometimes the next day, they had finished with their project. And Swami Krinanda said, you know, all the monks that had stayed and done the work were feeling so high, so rejuvenated, so energized. He said it was it's so joyful. He said even though after 12 hours, 14 hours of pouring cement, that's how they felt. And yet this guy that was sitting on the bank, he was miserable. He was unhappy. He was tired. What's the difference? Well, it's our attitude, isn't it? It's how we approach what it is that we're doing. And if we can bring God into what it is that we're doing, whether it's doing our homework because we're still in school, <laughs> or whether we're cooking for our family, or whether we're trying to give these talks up here, <laughs> whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You know, we just do our best and we give it to God. And that's really the whole scenario of this talk. Do your best, give it to God, and always see God as the doer. Always bring God into everything you do. And this isn't easy, I know, so I'm going to do a little bit more with this because um, I'll give you some hints. We have what we call Rajasi Day at, uh, at our community and also at the village and many other places. Rajasi Janakananda was uh, Yogananda's foremost um, male disciple and a great soul and saint in, in himself. And uh, he deserved the name of a, a saint because... He was not only a very successful businessman, but he was also um, very much a yogi. And as Master, as Yogananda said, he achieved liberation in this lifetime. And he did it, he said, by putting God first, always. He'd go into his office in the morning early, and he'd tell the secretary, wherever he's on, not to disturb him until 10 o'clock. He was busy. And guess what he was busy doing? He was meditating. He was praying to God in those three or four hours before he opened for business. And as he said, it was because of that, that he was centered in that higher self, that he was able to do so much. And he was so successful at what he did. So we have these Rajasi days at the community. We call them work, their work days, their service days. And we get to do all sorts of fun things outdoors, planting gardens and raking leaves and you know, mowing grass and all that kind of stuff, or, or inside, we're in the kitchen working and cleaning. So, but, and, and what we do to help us to keep our mind on God, to make this really service and not work, is we, first of all, we, we meditate together to start with. We then do this um, service in silence. You know, when you're silent, you can keep your mind more in control, can't you? Because when you're chattering away, you know, you're frittering your energy outward. But when you're not, then you can take it inward. And you can begin to focus that energy towards God. And so we, we do our service in silence. And every, um, we've started the practice of ringing the bell. We have a gong that we ring. And we ring the gong once every hour. So it kind of brings us back into that memory of what we're doing. And so it's a wonderful way to practice this, we call it practicing the presence, just bringing God into what we're doing. God is the doer. And most of us after a work day, and even though many people don't physically do a lot of labor, you know, we, we feel energized. And nobody does feel very tired because we're practicing the presence. So how do we do this besides ringing bells, gongs, um, practicing being silent, which of course we can't do. 
I mean, you know, most of us can't practice in silence all the time. It's not possible. So it's a couple other hints when we're um, doing this is to have a mantra of some sort. You know, in other words, something revolving in your mind about um, something that will be uplifting for you. And, you know, a mantra can be, I know um, Sister Gyanamata, Mata, his foremost dis- woman disciple, had the, the mantra of God alone, God alone, God alone. And Reverend Bernard, who was one of the old, the, the SRF, Self-Realization Fellowship monks, there for many, many, many years. I remember I was there once and I heard him give a talk. And I was very impressed with him. And he said that, his mantra that he revolved on his mind all the time was, I love you, God. And it showed on his face that he did. It showed in his vibration that he did. So pick a mantra that will work for you, um, because this is an important part of it. It can be a, 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 a chant, I want only thee, Lord, a song keep calling him, keep calling him, whatever it might be, but practice it. And you know, at first you might do it for a minute or two, but as you keep bringing your mind back to it, it starts to work on its own. You can also pause now and then, you know. Sometimes we take a deep breath and just consciously breathe. Inhale, exhale, just watch that breath. You can practice a hong sa technique if you, if you know hong sa. Inhale, hong, exhale, sa. Or inhale a mantra, I am, exhale, peace. Inhale, I am, exhale, free. Or whatever, you know, whatever fills that to keep your mind on the fact that you are a higher presence. You're not just this little egoic self that we tend to work from all the time. So seeing God as the doer, um, all those things help. I know Friday night we had a, a, a wonderful production here at our yoga hall. It was uh, put on by our Living Wisdom School children, all eight grades, preschool right through grade eight. And uh, Kathleen Spaulding was our drama teacher. Anyway, it was just an unbelievable production all the years I worked in the school. And we've been growing, you know, we've been growing from preschoolers. Now we're, we're all the way up to eighth grade. But um, we really topped it off this time. It was a wonderful production. And for many of us, we were parking down below at the bank because, you know, the, there isn't enough parking for everything here. And we had a lot of parents and friends coming to it. And, I, and if you all remember, Friday night was the night of the big storm. And um, yeah, it was, it was sheets of rain, and it was blowing a, you know, all over the place. So parking down there to get up here, you know, I was scratching my head thinking, well, you know, I've got a raincoat, and uh, that's about it. And you know, raincoat comes down only so far. This, I'm going to get wet. And I thought, well, OK, it's OK. I, I wasn't really upset about getting wet, but I was concerned about getting wet. And then, you know, suddenly, you know what came into my mind? Because this is now my mantra. I've had several of them, you know, over these many decades that I've been on the path. But right now, it's been many years, a couple of years now, I've been doing this mantra. And this mantra that I um, keep repeating is, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And I remember I was just getting ready to step out of the car after all these, these thoughts, and you know, it just came. Thank you, God. And I went, oh, yeah, thank you for this rain. Thank you for the wind. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to park down here so that others can, can um, be closer. Because I'm still fortunate. I can walk, and I can get around, and I can drive, and all those things that I'm so fortunate. And I was so filled with joy. Suddenly, it just like it just came and hit me. Thank you, God. And you know, I walked up here getting quite soaked, and just with that mantra in in my heart, and you know, it came. It's because I've been consciously practicing it for a long time now, and do I say it all the time? No, but I sure try. 
um, but you know, it's, it's enough so that it begins to become a part of who you are. So work with that. See if maybe this could be something that can help you. Find something where that will begin to take over that's going to help you grow ever closer in that awareness that you are. You are that God consciousness. You are not this body. You are not what you do. You are just simply a body that is able to function as a channel for Divine Mother, for God. And as we begin to know that in our soul, we begin to just be like what that presence is, which is joy. It's love, unconditional love. It's peace, it's calmness, it's those qualities that is what we're seeking in the outward world. So just start bringing that into your service. Because service is, as Master said, half the battle. And the more you can do that, the easier it is to also bring that into your meditation. So the meditation in your service, as Rajasi Janakananda was, he was, he was a perfect example of balance in his life, because balance is what we need. Balance of service, balance of meditation. And service is taking care of your family. It's not just, you know, cleaning up after the, the meal, but it's taking care of your family. It's cooking for your, your family. It's taking your children to school. It's, it's all those things that you do. It's all service. And if you can just say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, or whatever, it takes over. And it helps you to grow ever closer to God in that way. So, thank you. Take a moment of silence. Reading from Whispers from Eternity, Prayers on the Beads of Love. I tell my prayers on the beads of love, strung with my devotion. I direct them beyond all names, God, Spirit, Brahma, Christ, Shankara, Krishna, Buddha, Mohammed, for all names are thine. And I shun no name, for I know thou dwellest in all forms. In thy cosmic dramas on the stage of time, and in thy myriad acting roles, thou hast assumed innumerable names. Behind them all, too, I know thy one changeless name, eternal, conscious, self-existent bliss. Many times have I played with thee. Many songs of thine have I sung. On the ocean bosom of thy eternal life, I have been nurtured by thee as a tiny drop of life. I remember thy warm touch through the centuries, whenever, feeling the chill of separation, I turned homeward to thee. Again, in this daylight of remembrance, let me play with thee. Let me sing thy songs. 